Hello again YouTube, it's John, also known as the Old Geek, and it's review time again. In my last video I asked you what you wanted me to look at next, and this one got a few mentions. And this is L2 The Assassin's Knot. Plus, it's about five or six years since I last looked through this adventure, five or six years since I last ran it, so it was nice to uh, leaf through it again. Written by Leonard Lakofka and published in 1983, The Assassin's Knot was the second in the Lendor Isles series of adventures. The first being the low-level sandbox The Secret of Bone Hill. Lakofka, who sadly passed away in 2020, was a regular contributor in the early days of the hobby, being responsible for the Leomond's Tiny Hut column in Dragon Magazine, named after his character Leomond a name that lives on in later editions of the game. In recent years I encountered Leonard in the AD&D Facebook groups. He would regularly pop up in gaming discussions to offer his opinions, which were frequently quite strong. As with L1, L2 is intended for a relatively low level party. The cover suggests levels 2 to 5 and internally the text suggests about 20 levels in total. Before I get into the meat of the adventure itself, let's start with presentation, as always. L2, The Assassin's Knot, suffers from being the proud bearer of one of the most abysmal pieces of cover art. Even the buxom barmaid's assets cannot rescue this drab image. I guess it's supposed to look sinister, but I think it just looks crap. Internally, the maps are very good. Outdoor maps are clear and colourful and the maps of buildings are bold and easy to read. Internal artwork is very mixed though. There are a couple of interesting pieces including one of a thief departing through a window and I also like the booklet cover of an assassin observing the castle but the remainder are somewhat mediocre and a little lacking in character. Text presentation is pretty typical of the era although there are no box text descriptions, but that's not an issue. There are a few inconsistencies, however, in the form of spelling mistakes and typos, not unusual from 1983 TSR. But there is a more serious fault with the text. I'll come to that later in the review. As is clear by its title, The Assassin's Knot is a module about dastardly deeds. Grellus, the Baron of Restenford, has been murdered, and the party have been contacted by a local sorcerer by the name of Peltar, and asked to try to catch the killers and bring them to justice. Several clues were helpfully left at the scene, and all point to a nearby village called Garotten. Now, Mr. Lakofka gives us the pronunciation Garotten, but it's spelt G-A-R-R-O-T-T-E-N, thus it will be Garotten. With a name like that, you can imagine what the place will be like, though. They might as well have named it Murderville. So, this module is a D&D murder mystery. As you can imagine, the group's focus needs to be on roleplay, diplomacy, clue finding, and problem solving. If they try to go into Garotten all heavy-handed, then they are likely to be out of their depth pretty quickly. The module is filled with NPCs to help bring the town to life, but details regarding personalities and motivations are somewhat scant beyond certain key individuals directly relevant to the plot. This, this uh, shouldn't cause a DM too much trouble though, as a DM for any group who would enjoy this type of adventure is likely to be not averse to improvisation. The character information where it is provided is very good. I particularly like the idea of the senile high priest, who is a well-meaning liability, and his despairing assistants who have to look after him, make excuses for him, and cover his day-to-day -day duties. Also, the little group of light-fingered stagehands at the theatre provide ample opportunity for some fun. Key to this module is the concept of time, though the players might not be aware of that, certainly not at the beginning. Lakofka suggests a series of events that can be used during play, mostly serving as delaying tactics. These are interesting and offer fertile seeds for yet more roleplay. Eventually, the clues should all fall into place, and there is then the potential for an action-packed finale against intelligent opponents. This part of the adventure requires thorough planning on the part of the players. 
The Assassin's Knot is not an especially easy module to run. There are a lot of moving parts and the DM needs to be thoroughly versed in all of them at all times. With so many NPCs, many of whom have different motivations and know different snippets of information, I would strongly advise anyone wanting to run this module to make copious notes beforehand. The players should also have an organised approach and be cautious and patient, and this will not suit every group. If they charge in wanting instant gratification and glory, then they are certain to fail dismally. Now onto the problem with the text that I mentioned earlier. An aspect of the module that really does not help the DM is the fact that information is quite liberally spread out. For instance, some NPCs have certain info given with their stats, which are listed in a separate place in the module to their location, where there is more info about them. And often the DM is then referred to yet another page for follow-up information as to how that NPC connects with another NPC. It would have benefited from having all of the various characters listed in one place with all key clues and traits listed there too, along with the suggested events and the timeline, one central point of reference for the DM. Another problem for me with the adventure is that, is that the solution hinges on the main bad guy using a new magic item, one created specifically for this adventure, and that to me feels like a little bit of a cop-out. But perhaps the biggest issue for me is the believability of the whole setup. Gorotten is a nasty, seedy place overflowing with assassins, and yet the populace are mostly lawful neutral in alignment, which suggests security, order and routine. There are a lot of little businesses in Gorotten, and the town itself is very small. Where are the customers coming from given the town's lack of size and terrible reputation? These little lapses of logic seem insignificant, but given that the party are supposed to spend a while in the town and get to know quite a few of the town's folk, they may become a little jarring. Finally, there's the NPC names. This is a heavy roleplay scenario, and for that to be effective the group need to be well immersed in the environment. And that's difficult when they are talking to Rillis, Willis or Phyllis, or a dwarf called Gilmy. Yeah. Or two unrelated people called Basma and Balma. After going to all the effort of writing an intriguing and innovative scenario, it is spoiled by lazy NPC naming doesn't help when the players are giggling when they hear the PC names. If I was to run this again, I'd keep the general plot intact and uproot the whole thing to a big city and rename a lot of the NPCs. In fact that's precisely what I did when I last ran it about five years ago and it all worked pretty well. If you're going to stick to the Lendor Isles location, then I strongly recommend running it in tandem with the secret of Bone Hill, and ensure that the party have plenty of dealings with the unfortunate Baron before he is murdered, to make sure they are nicely invested in the plot. And still change the stupid names. The DM should also be very patient, and try to portray the NPCs with a degree of reticence and suspicion force the players to make the effort to win the helpful ones over and slowly build the tension with the bad guys. Assassins are meant to be intelligent, devious and secretive, so the DM needs to make this a priority when planning the adventure. L2, the Assassin's Knot, is an interesting scenario. It's something different. It has the potential to be very entertaining in the hands of the right DM with a group who relish the different challenges it poses. It wasn't the first investigative module for D&D, but it was certainly the first attempt at a murder mystery, and for the most part it works. But it does need the DM 
to put in quite a lot of work to fill in the gaps, to iron out the kinks, and to inject life into the reams of NPCs. It is tough to run, and it is tougher to run well. I'm going to give this module 6 out of 10. It's a brave and often intriguing effort, but it is somewhat let down by its execution. If you have a group of players who you know will react well to the style of game it demands, then it is worth the effort that is required to make it work. But if they lean towards traditional dungeoneering or combat heavy games, then best ignore it. Well, that concludes another review from me, the old geek. Click the thingies below, have your say, give me a like, whatever. Next week, I'm planning to look at WG4. But until then, good night.